Greetings and good day to you, my listeners. It's Michael Shermer. It's time for another episode of the Michael Shermer Show. This one brought to you by Wondrium. Wondrium, the former teaching company, brings you engaging educational content through short form videos, long form courses, tutorials, how to lessons, travel logs, documentaries, and more. I love all the courses, the actual courses, where they have a dozen or two dozen or even three dozen lectures. Lectures are 20 to 30 minutes each. I listen to them at 1.3 speed. It's just great. Every day I can do two, three lectures. If it's a long bike ride or a long drive, I can take half the course in one shot. It's great. Uh, so here's the deal. If you subscribe through the show at wondrium.com slash Shermer, you get two years for the price of one. Why would you not do this? Just do this right now. <laughs> Two years for the price of one, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M slash Shermer, S-H-E-R-M-E-R, and you get two years for the price of one. Here's an example of one that you will know why I like this one. Ban books, burn books, forbidden literary works. As you know, I'm a free speech fundamentalist. Just put it all out there. Let people say whatever they want, especially in writing. That has not always been the case. In fact, it's still not always the case. So here's a few of the lectures that uh, I'm going to listen to here. Ulysses on trial. Ulysses? Yeah. Yep, uh, later, Lady Chatterley's Lover, oh boy, probably pretty tame compared to today. Censors from the Inquisition to the Puritans, and they should go to cancel culture as well. Maybe that's the last lecture here. Uh, Books on Fire, the Reformation to Rushdie, and this was probably produced before Rushdie was attacked last year, so it's gotten worse in that regard. Uh, let's see, authors who censored themselves, well, we all do that. I mean, you have to do some censoring. To a certain extent, Huckleberry Finn and Race in America, as you probably heard, um, uh, they have been doing some revising of Huckleberry Finn for the language used, even though he used it in a way we would find acceptable in the sense he's, he, he's against racism, race and racism uh, as it's used. To Kill a Mockingbird, Then and Now, The Battle Over Critical Race Theory, here we go, We're right up to the uh, modern times here, The Textbook Wars, The Backlash Against Harry Potter, yeah, well, that's true. A lot of Christian conservatives were not too crazy about Harry Potter. Uh, but now the left has gone after J.K. Rowling for other things. So it never ends. It's a super interesting problem in society, a civil society. What do you do with dangerous ideas and dangerous books? Well, check it out. Okay, that's my plug uh, for uh, today's course here. Check that out. Ban books, burn books. All right, and do it by going to wondrium.com slash Shermer. Get two years for the price of one. Again, the podcast is supported through Wondrium and the Skeptic Society. We're not selling you ads uh, for pillows and slippers and painkillers and all that stuff. Just good content. And Wondrium is a great source of that. All right, here's the show. My guest today is Ursula Goodenough. She is a professor emerita of biology at Washington University. One of America's leading cell biologists, she is the author of a best-selling textbook on genetics is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has served as president of the American Society of Cell Biology and of the Institute on Religion in an Age of Science. She lives in Chilmark, Massachusetts on Martha's Vineyard where she is speaking to us today. Her book, The Sacred Depths of Nature, How Life Has Emerged and Evolved is now in a second edition, which is why she has come on the show to talk to us about this. By the way, Ursula, this is a beautiful book. Uh, I mean, a tribute not just to you, but to the publisher, Oxford University Press, for spending the money on the on the beautiful paper, four color inserts of <laughs> of photographs. I mean, check that out. I mean, most publishers <laughs> don't do that. Right? They tried. To, they kept trying to take it away from me, and I said, "Ah, eh. <laughs> we oh, made a did? deal." Yeah, they wanted to reduce <laughs> yeah, the. Uh, they, yeah, he said, "What would you think about putting all the pictures in the middle uh, in uh, an insert?" And I said, "Yeah, because eh. it saves money." I understand. I mean, publishers, yeah. you know, but. Look at those but trilobites. So yeah, that's great. I love that. It's and of gorgeous. course, that's got to be a Galapagos tortoise, right? It is. Yeah. Good. Did you take that picture? <laughs> I wish I did. No, uh, there's a yeah. wonderful photographer on the, on the <laughs> islands. Uh, well, so I have a lot of things I want to talk to you about as a biologist, great. but also as a scientist. And here is, I'm going to read from the uh, your personal preference from the first edition in 1997. No question about it. I'm writing this book because of my father. He started off as a Methodist preacher, but became absorbed, no, obsessed, with a need to understand why people are religious. As a professor of history of religion, 
He poured out book after book on the ancient Jews and early Christians, their art, texts, motivations, and then he brought it all home to me, sitting there after dessert, trying to look inconspicuous while he and the other Yale scholars drank a great deal of wine and held forth on Plato and Paul and Freud and Sartre. Dad began his, fa- began his famous undergraduate course, The Psychology of Religion, by announcing, I do not believe in God. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> And he ended one of his last books by admitting, I still pray devoutly, and when I do, I forget my qualifications and quibbles and call upon Jesus, and he comes to me. Okay, that's, you have to explain this. <laughs> How is it <laughs> somebody is religious, prays to Jesus, and doesn't believe in God? Well, I think what he's saying in that last part, that's a quote from a book that he wrote. And I think what he's trying to say is that if you have that stuff instilled in you from birth, and you can pray and you can get this thing. He can still do it when he, you know, when he really needs it. And, uh, you know, something happens to him psychologically. He would say in a heartbeat that he didn't believe that Jesus was actually, you know, in the room or anything, uh, but that he was able to use that venue to access his own grief or whatever it was that was troubling him. So and, I mean, more... I can't I can't do that because uh, I didn't get the early training and probably you can't either. But um, huh. he was just being honest about how his brain worked. Interesting. So would you describe it as more of a a meditative, just thoughtful reflection upon the moment? And he's not talking to anybody other yeah, than I mean, I, I wish I wish we could bring him in the room so he could tell us <laughs> <laughs> what was actually happening. Alas, he died a long time ago. But, um, you know, I think that there are all sorts of ways that people I know, friends who have, you know, in meditative practice or in all sorts of, in, you know, certainly in, under the influence of drugs uh, can have all sorts of experiences that um, don't mesh with their rational uh, way of doing things. Right. So what's going on there? Is this what I call logic tight compartments that you just separate them like the. I haven't like, read your book. So I, no, I, I, you know, uh, it could be, I mean, how about, how about people who, um, go out in the woods and, and, you know, the animists who think that the mountains are speaking to them, um, you know, they really believe it. Um, and I can't say that, you know, I could say that I am very, very confident that, mo- that mountains don't speak in any way that I can understand. But I also, I'm sure they're having experiences of some sort. Oh, for sure. Uh, but as a biologist and a professional scientist for a long career, I mean, w- at some point, don't you ask, well, where's the control group <laughs> or something like that? Or are you willing to say, look, this is just something outside of science. This is not under the realm of empirical testing. Well, I mean, presumably something's going on in their brain, and presumably if they were in an fMRI, you know, this activity could be recorded. But, I mean, come on, we're not, we don't understand how that, there's some missing links between fMRI signals and what we experience. And um, so I'm not saying they're mysterious or supernatural or anything of the sort. I'm just saying that we, you know, they're neurobiologists by the thousands right now trying to figure it out. Hmm. Right. I guess what I'm getting at is, is, you know, different kinds of truths, right? So you have oh, empirical yeah. scientific truths mm-hmm. and maybe what you're talking about here, uh, what religious people are talking about, and then what you're talking about with, with sacred depths of nature, sort of sacred naturalism or whatever, is a different realm. It's something not in the same kind of truth value yeah. as, as science. Not, I mean, the religious naturalist orientation, the whole point is you take the science-based understandings to mind and you respond to them um, using, uh, you know, capacities that we have, such as gratitude, reverence, and so on, um, that are speaking to this account as opposed to an account of what Jesus did in Damascus or something. Mm. Um, But, you know, that's how I see religious... uh, traditions working is that there's a story, there's an account, and then you respond to it. And the one that I'm trying to uh, lift up is one where what you're responding to is what science is telling us about how the natural world works. So the question is, what's its religious potential? You know, does it generate gratitude? Does it generate 
reverence. It sure does to me. Um, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's what I'm trying to describe in this book. So how do you define religion then in that case? Well, there's a big difference between religion and religious in my mind. Mm. So religion is a, you know, an institution with brick and mortar and clergy and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and something that you're supposed to believe in. If you are a Buddhist, you're supposed to believe in reincarnation, for example. Um, and religious, I think of as a capacity, a human capacity, um, that takes accounts and responds to them in a religious fashion. So what do we mean by religious fashion? Uh, I have three criteria. Yeah. One is that the story, the account is interpreted in sort of existential response, philosophical response. What does this story of nature tell me about the meaning of life, uh, about death? Uh, you know, how do I respond to it? The second is spiritual. How do I feel about it internally? And that's back to these more gratitude, reverence, humility kinds of inner experiences. And then the third is moral. What does this account tell me about how I should interact with other humans and with the rest of the planet and the universe? Nice. So the three different activities that hopefully come together and, and reinforce one another and tell each other how things are going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm on board with that. I get that. And I think today, at least in the age of modern science, most religious believers, at least in the United States, they want it to actually be true. I mean, really true. Like Jesus really existed. He was really crucified. He was really resurrected and he really died for my sins, really. Not mythically, not metaphorically, really happened. Absolutely. So what do you say to somebody like that? Uh, I say those are beliefs and I don't share them. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, and do you want to know how I do it is probably the next thing I do. And then I might hand them my book. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you don't get anywhere telling people that, what's really important to them is, is, you know, not something that you believe is the case. Uh, they have to get there themselves and you can hand them a book and see if that helps out. But I've never, I mean, I, I when I'm with believers, uh, they tell me they're believers and I say, I'm not. And, you know, we either end the conversation or we talk about something else or whatever. Right. So you have these kind of three models of the relationship, science and religion is kind of conflict model. One of them's right. One of them's wrong. This kind of overlapping where they're both different avenues of the same, uh, exploring the same reality. And the other where they're like Gould's non-overlapping magisteria. They just have nothing to do with each other. Uh, m maybe what you're describing doesn't quite fit any of those three, but, or, or those never, those never made, I mean, the, what I'm suggesting is is sort of starting over, um, mm. not uh, taking an existing tradition and asking what you're going to do with it in terms of scientific understandings, because there's so many places where you have to, you know, wave your hands. And so I'm suggesting that another approach was to take a new story, what we're calling everybody's story, which is, you know, pretty recent. We've only, in the last... 30 or 40 years really pulled physics and chemistry and biology and sociology together, uh, let alone all that we've learned about evolution. So there's a huge story there, uh, much richer to my mind than, than the Bible or the Quran, um, that is there. And the question is, do you just take it to, if you're a naturalist, I would say you take it to mind. You, you know, this is, this is where it is. I can look up the data and I can, convince myself that yeah that's that's really the case um and um or you can say okay how does this make me feel and how does this uh what does this tell me about how i should behave with respect to other beings or you know uh and what does it tell me about death how do, how do i how do i use it in the same way that the stories of the traditional religions have been used to 
organize the thinking and the feeling of their parishioners. It's it's a whole new thing, in which case, you know, it's not, I mean, yeah, the magisteria are totally overlapping. Um, if you say that uh, a lot of my moral understandings come from my understanding that I'm a primate, that I come from a social species, that um, there are uh, all sorts of social emotions, if you will, that I inherit at birth that have to do with nurture and bonding. And, and so there's all sorts of stuff that can be informative <laughs> in uh, forging one's religious orientation. Right. So let's start with the, the story you start with here, which you quote from Loyal Rue. Uh, this is your every every person's, the story for everybody. The everybody's universe, story. Everybody's <laughs> story. The universe is a single reality, one long, sweeping, spectacular process of interconnected events. The universe is not a place where evolution happens. It is the evolution happening. It's not a stage on which drama unfolds. It is the unfolding drama itself. If ever there were a candidate for a universal story, it must be this story of cosmic evolution. The story shows us the deepest possible sense that we are all sisters and brothers, fashioned from the same stellar dust, energized by the same star, nourished by the same planet, endowed with the same genetic code, and threatened by the same evils. This story, more than any other, humbles us before the magnitude and complexity of creation. Like no other story, it bewilders us with the improbability of our existence, astonishes us with the interdependence of all things, and makes us feel grateful for the lives we have. And not the least of all, it inspires us to express our gratitude to the past by accepting a solemn and collective responsibility for the future. Man, that's a great story right there in one paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> Go loyal. <laughs> Who is loyal, Rue? I don't uh, know much. Oh, about Oh, he's him. he's wonderful. He's written a bunch of books. He he was really my mentor in all of this, and uh, he's mm. recently retired as a philosopher at a school in Iowa called Luther College. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I think the last time you and I saw each other was at the Esalon Institute in Big Sur. Right. right? Mm -hmm. You were given a talk on I think the on symbolic communication and something like that. Well, right? I, I think I was more groupy than anything else. I was there with Terry Deacon, who is another one of my mentors. And um, so I, I'm not, I don't even remember whether I gave a talk or not. I was there twice. But. Yeah, you did. It was great. Uh, but again, that, that, that kind of setting is very conducive to what you're talking about, this kind of religious naturalism or you know, the sacred depths of nature. You know, when you're on the cliffs of the Pacific Ocean in the hot tubs, you know, it, it, it is kind naked. of a... Naked. <laughs> yeah, naked, yeah. Yeah, that's right. The clothing optional hot tubs, right. <laughs> uh, the yep. first time I, I went there, you know, I was a little shy about it, so I went and I wore my running shorts, and then I realized wow. I'm the only one with anything on, so it seemed kind of dumb. <laughs> it's one of those conventions, I guess, you, you can throw off pretty quickly if everybody else goes along with it, shifting norms like that. You have um, to realize that nobody really wants to look at your junk. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, but so, but I get the same kind of feeling like uh, uh, my wife's from Cologne, Germany. So we, whenever we go to visit her family, we go into the dome there, in central town. And it's just magnificent. I mean, I think it's the second largest cathedral in all of Europe. And I know I, it well. I, I have a good yeah, friend in yeah. Cologne. So. Oh, okay. All right, good, yeah. <laughs> So you know that feeling. So I, when I do that, when I go there, I kind of cast myself back 500 years and imagine, you know, this is the biggest thing anyone's ever seen. And, you know, they come from these little nothing uh, provincial towns to visit this magnificent cathedral and the stained glass windows and the shafts of light pouring in and the organ music, all that it must have done what you're talking about here in a different way. That is kind of evoke awe and wonder. Sure, it evokes awe and wonder in all of us. I mean, how, you know, if you're not <clears throat> responsive to the Cologne Cathedral, then, you know, you're deaf and blind or something. <laughs> um, right. I mean, and, and the people building those cathedrals knew exactly what they were doing in terms of eliciting the kind of awe and fear almost that would induce the parishioners to obey the rules that they were setting out for people and put the money on the plate 
because you know that's how how the tradition worked. How do you think they, they figured would... that out? Just do trial and error over thousands of years of religion, <laughs> that's, kind that's of. That's a really good question. I mean, we sh I'm sure religious art hist historians have can tell us about various movements, but you know, they, they're also very different. So, I mean, the Buddhist tradition, for example, has none of that stuff. It's very serene. The Buddha is always looking very calm. And that elicits, in, that religious art also moves me, but in a very different way. I'm, I'm calmed, I'm centered when I look at Buddhist art. So different cultures have come up with different stuff. But with commonalities there, again, trying to, I guess, take you away from the mundane, everyday uh, aspects of life and to reflect on the bigger picture, the meaning of life, morality, purpose, yep. relationships. Yep. Right. I'll, get, I'll read you my favorite example from, uh, of what you're talking about here from uh, Sagan's opening in Cosmos. You know, remember, and and he's standing on the cliffs at Big Sur, he's just down below, south of uh, of Esalon Institute. This is where he, you know, so the waves are crashing in slow motion, and he says the universe is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Our contemplation of the cosmos stirs us. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a great height. We know we are approaching the grandest of mysteries. And then he goes on to say, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We've begun at last to wonder about our origins. Star stuff contemplating the stars, organized collections of 10 billion, billion, billion atoms contemplating the evolution of matter, tracing that long path by which it arrived at consciousness here on the planet Earth and perhaps throughout the cosmos. Our obligations to survive and flourish is owed not just to ourselves, but also to that cosmos, ancient and vast from which we spring. Now that is spiritual gold by a man who was not a theist, probably an agnostic, I guess. <clears throat> I, I think he's called himself an atheist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I mean, agnostic is just kind of a wishy-washy thing. It doesn't <laughs> get you anywhere. <laughs> Stephen Colbert called it uh, atheist without balls. <laughs> 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 Although I would, I should point out that, you know, Huxley coined that term in 1869. He meant not waiting to see if there's a, another experiment or being wishy-washy. He meant it's not knowable in any mm -hmm. scientific sense. And, and I think If it that, were, scientists would be on it. You know, I mean, if, if there were a hypothesis where you could test whether it was a god or not, duh. <laughs> Talk about how you would get famous. Uh, you'd test it. It's just that nobody has any idea how you would frame that frame those experiments. Well, so uh, maybe like Victor Stanger explored this idea, the, uh, God, the testable hypothesis that he's failed the test. So the idea <laughs> like the problem of evil or why, why should the universe be structured in a way with so much entropy and the second law of thermodynamics, everything just runs down. It doesn't seem like it's designed by a loving, all powerful, all knowing God. Right. For sure. <laughs> Um, the all-powerful, all-knowing, and benevolent uh, fails the test on many levels. So mm -hmm. people have to say that God works in mysterious ways. I mean, you know, there are ways around it, but um, there are more and more people who are realizing that that's not working for them, mm -hmm. as we know from the Pew surveys. Mm -hmm. Right. Although since your book was published in 1997, there's been a quite a striking growth of the nuns, so-called mm -hmm. no religious affiliation, the nuns. And it's what, maybe a quarter of everybody and a third of millennials now, I think, have Something no like religious yeah. affiliation. Now, they're not necessarily atheists, but right. but they don't right. belong to a religion. They don't, so not going to church on Sunday or Saturday, that, that one you can quantitate, okay? Uh, they either go or they don't, or they lie to you. Um, <laughs> if um, they, uh, this isn't to say that the nuns don't have other things going on in their spiritual life, and what those of us who are developing this religious naturalist orientation are, you know, lifting up as one possibility. But here's, here's some... And, you know, it's really important to stress that this orientation 
has no dogma, has no, there's all sorts of interpretations. There are all sorts of spiritual responses. There are all sorts of ways of reading what our ethical responsibilities are. So it, that's one of the reasons I like it, uh, is because there's, it's rich and uh, all sorts of ways to find one's place. So with religious naturalism, you invite all religious people from other religions into the tent. They want to be there. Come on <laughs> in. <laughs> you can set up your booth and we'll see if anybody goes over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean you don't have a missionary program where you go knocking no. on doors? <laughs> giving Nothing them copies like of The Sacred Depths of Nature <laughs> or no. Carl Sagan's Cosmos or whatever? No. We, we, have a, we have an association. We call it the Religious Naturalist Association. It's an online thingy, 501c3. And we have... A thousand members, I think, and from all fifty states and thirty countries. So you know, it's 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 an idea that's out there um, that we're trying very hard to let people have access to and see whether they're mm. yeah you know, right. Why well, isn't it? See if you salute. <laughs> why isn't it a thousand, a hundred thousand, or a million? Maybe it will be. We just we're just starting out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How many yeah. people listen to your podcast, Michael? <laughs> uh, well, so it's about 100,000, so maybe okay. we'll get some new members here. We'll put the link in to, uh, for people to join. Okay. When, if they join, what do they do? What happens? What, what, Absolutely what nothing. It's nothing. free. We, oh. we have a monthly newsletter. And, okay. You know, we figure that religious naturalists presumably are likely already, you know, uh, giving money to good causes and mm. marching in demonstrations and, and, you know, acting out their uh, orientation. And it's not like we have to do that. But, mm. you know, it's also hard to get people together. We have a Facebook group and some people show up, but I don't know. We're just, we're just starting out. But uh, well, I think my, maybe the part of the problem is, is you don't have a set of dogmas. Like these are the 12 things we believe Right. And if you if you agree, you should come, and we're going to fight against those uh, bad people over there, and 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 promote our cause. That's not what you're doing, right? So yeah. it's a little bit like herding cats, you know, like libertarians trying to get to be a big political organization <laughs> when, by definition, they hate big political organizations, right? Uh, and you know, or secular humanists that you know, I've been to some of these meetings where they meet on Sundays, you know, and they sing hymns to Newton and they light candles and tell <laughs> testimonials about how they lost their religion. You know, it just was never my thing. I just like, uh, I have other things I'd rather do Sunday morning, you know, like go ride my bike. But, um, but you know, the idea though, I remember when Paul Kurtz gave me his, you know, I have a dream speech, so to speak, about um, building a secular, the equivalent of a secular humanist church in every city in America, where, you know, we have weddings and funerals and ceremonies and meetings every week and, you know, babysitting and free parking, <laughs> right? Uh, so, and the idea behind that being is that, People, humans have a religious impulse that needs to be met, you know, like sex and hunger and, you know, whatever, sleep or whatever. There's something like a religious impulse. If we don't replace it with something, people are going to turn to these darker tribal religions. So we need to build something. That was the idea. Yeah. So the question is whether secular humanism uh, is, you know, something that's going to appeal to everybody. Uh, clearly it doesn't because it's been around for a while. And I mean, you know, again, we're talking thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. We're not talking about you know, five billion people. So, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, it's, um, you know, how this is all going to play out in the future. I mean, this, so I don't really remember, I have this whole sort of fantasy in the beginning of Sacred Depths of Nature, where I talk about how this kind of orientation would at least be because it's based on everybody's story and it isn't, um, a, it's it's based on the scientific understandings and not the interpretations of it, that it could be a good framework for having planetary discussions having to do with climate change, uh, ending wars, etc. cetera. Um, yeah. And, you know, I just put it out there because I think it would be cool if that were true, but we're obviously very far away from that. Mm. Could you see a time in, I don't know, 500 years, 1,000 years from now when religion has completely fallen into disuse, what we think of as religion today? 
Well, again, we're doing religion on religious. Uh, yeah, I mean, religion. There, there you know, Judaism, be, Christianity, yeah, Islam. Yeah, uh, it may well be that the that the uh, you know the people who still like to do that uh, will diminish. This is already happening. I mean, most of the churches in Europe are closed, um, yeah, yeah. and so it's not a question of whether; it's just a question of when. But I think that's the trend, and so the question is. What if Kurtz is right and there is this religious impulse that humans have? Um, what could replace it as satisfying that urge? And we're suggesting one. Po I'm suggesting one possibility in the book. Yeah. And and I will say, I get lots of testimonials. <laughs> See, it works for a lot of people. But so you should we're post them on your web page and go. You too could have a an epiphany uh, here. Well, you know that that humans have a sexual impulse doesn't mean we have to have playboy clubs in every city, right? There's many different right. ways to express one's religious sentiments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like most of the Jews I know are atheists and yet they're Jews, they're cultural Jews. They go to, you know, they, uh, they honor the holidays and, mm -hmm. and so forth. So that that's what you're talking about. It's the, what rich well, sacred cultural rituals. Jews, of course, is, is a specific example because there is an ethnicity there um, that's, you know, weighed in and who did you marry and who, <laughs> I mean, yeah. all sorts of stuff. But uh, an easier one to think about maybe is the Christian thing, which is all over the place. It includes Greek Orthodox and converts in Africa and everything. And, you know, there are lots of people who have bought into that and missionaries worked very hard to get that to happen. But it's, it's, I think a lot of Christians are like Jews, although they won't say it they They really are doing it because it's part of their heritage. It's baptism is supposed to happen and marriages are supposed to happen in using particular language. But that doesn't mean that they, feel like they've given themselves to Christ or something. So what do you say to, to people like the new atheist, people like Richard Dawkins, or take somebody like Jerry Coyne, who coined this term, um, faithists, people, atheists who believe that faith is important. Sometimes he calls them accommodationists. I think he would probably call you an accommodation. Trying to make nice with religious people. Really, <laughs> it's just a bunch of bullshit that needs to be debunked. They're doing a great job. They've written lots of great books where they debunk it and show how stupid it is. Um, so there's no reason for me to pile on there. Um, I'm suggesting another thing, which is instead of focusing one's attention on how stupid that is, uh, maybe we can come up with something better. Okay. I like but that. But still use the R word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> The R word, religious, not religion. Religious, very good. Yes. You're catching on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Well, let's go through some of the hard problems because this is, you know, where the rubber meets the road, where the believer says, "Yeah, okay, that's nice flower flowerly language." But how do you explain the origins of the universe, the origins of consciousness, the origins of life, the origins of morality, the origins of DNA and RNA and all that? How do you? Th these are God, you know, gap gaps that God fills. For the believer, the fine tuneness of the universe, and so on. So let's just start. Why is there something rather than nothing? What is your answer? Mystery. Mystery. Yeah. <laughs> Chapter one. <laughs> but that, that's just a word. <laughs> what do you well, mean? No, it's the absence of an answer. Uh, you okay. know, uh, um, it, it's shrouded in its own absence of category. I mean, the uh, you don't have to. I mean, so. As I said, I quote the poem from Lao Tzu, 600 BC, you know, the Tao is not knowing you know, what's known as 10,000 things, and uh, they're things that we don't know. And so you could either say that, or you can say God did it, or right. the great spirit in the sky did it, or whatever you want to do, but uh, I'm perfectly happy uh, to join I, Lao Tzu. I, I think, uh, so I'll just read the Lao Tzu that you quote from the book. Okay. On page 19 here. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. 
The nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth. The named is the mother of ten thousand things. Ever desireless, one can see the mystery. Ever desiring, one sees the manifestations. These two spring from the same source but differ in name. This appears as darkness, darkness within darkness, the gate to all mystery. Man, I'd have to read that. I mean, I have read that several times. I think, what, what is he saying there again? Can you interpret, it, interpret that for us? <laughs> Other than mystery. I, yeah, I just interpret it as his okay. acknowledging that, that uh, you know, what we see and we understand, we still have this, where did it come from? You know, the recursive okay. uh, right. thing. And what I hear him saying is that we don't know and uh, deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the minute you start giving it names, then it, it, you haven't really gotten into the essence of the fact that you don't really know yeah. the big answer. You just know that the stone is here and that tree is there. So in other words, explanation has to stop somewhere. Yeah. And we just stop it there. Yeah. I mean, maybe it doesn't. Maybe, you know, uh, <laughs> Maybe our new telescopes will see some dude with a beard and a throne in the sky. Well, okay. but... <laughs> probably more like at the at, at the quantum level or string theory. Or yeah, well, something you know, like so, that. Uh, I'm yeah. only saying that to say that uh, mystery uh, to claim that mystery is forever is something that a scientist doesn't do. Right. Here's a quote from John Leslie and Robert Lawrence Kuhn's book. The mystery of existence. Why is there anything at all? So they go through the different kind of attempts to answer this. One of which is nothing is inconceivable. That is the word, you know, the idea of nothingness. Uh, it is impossible to conceptualize nothing. No space, time, matter, light, darkness, or even any conscious beings to perceive the nothingness. As Robert Kuhn conceives it, not just emptiness, not just blankness, and not just emptiness and blankness forever, but not even the existence of emptiness and not even the meaning of blankness and no forever. I mean, at this point, uh, uh, it's, I don't even know what he's talking about. I, I don't even know what I'm talking about other than. Well, <laughs> that's the, the point is that, you know, that isn't the case. There is something it's, you know, why is there anything at all rather than nothing? Nothing isn't the case. There is something there. Are there is energy? There are quantum right. uh, particles. We know that we can touch and feel and see them, and they evolved into us. Um, and so, but where they came from, and I mean, if somebody, some of these people who want to reconcile traditional religions with with um, our scientific understandings, I mean, the idea of a God who answers your prayers, but also creates, you know, muons and bosons. Um, it just doesn't, I don't see how anybody can really go there. They have to at some point say, well, this God is doing stuff that I don't, I don't understand, but I'll say he did it. <laughs> In other words, they're just punting it down the field one more step. To 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 something that that I can't relate to, uh, particularly if this same entity, the same God, can also you know cure your kid's cancer. I mean, it, the two don't the two are are not the same, and and so this whole personal God thing, having a relationship with a God or gods or Mary or a saint or whatever or Krishna, um, these these are you know, psychological realities, we're not going to, you can't sweep on under the rug. People tell you that that's how they work, how they live their lives is in these relationships. But that's a personal God. That God is fashioned like a human, understands, you know, is jealous. I mean, you know, has all the traits of a human. And that's true for the indigenous Gods as well, they get angry, they withhold rain uh, or give it. Um, and that kind of God just is a different breed of cat from something that could possibly create subatomic particles and concentrate them into a 
the precursor of the Big Bang. I mean, it, it just, the two just don't go together. So that's why this religion science dialogue to me just doesn't hold water. If you're interested in traditional religion, go for it. Um, and if you're interested in science, go for it. But you got a lot of work to do there in the middle. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it reminds not... me of that line from Bill Maher's religious film uh, where uh, one of the preachers he's talking to talks about God being angry and jealous. And he says, I know people have gotten over jealousy. <laughs> How can a God be jealous? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The old Testament God had a big problem with his self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. He had a few temper tantrums there. <laughs> right. But I suppose the believer might, well, okay, here's another angle on it. Uh, this is what uh, uh, you probably knew Martin Gardner. You know, he's kind of one of the founders of the modern skeptical movement vote for Scientific American forever, and um, was famously not an atheist, along with James Randi and Paul Kurtz and all the other founding members of the skeptical movement. He was a fideist, that is to say, in a William James pragmatism way, there's a kind of truth to taking the leap of faith, if you want, uh, on the big questions, that is, why there's something rather than nothing, God's existence, free will, determinism, something like that. And so he would, he made the argument that, um, that, he, well, regarding God's existence, atheists have slightly better arguments than theists do. I'll admit that. But, you know, they haven't disproved God, and there's no harm in my believing, and it works for me. It makes my life better. So I believe. I'm not trying to prove it. You don't have to believe. I'm not going to try to talk you into anything, just for me. Right. And then same thing with prayer and the existence of the afterlife. And so on is what I believe. Now, Randy and some of the other humanists and atheists were like, what? Martin Gardner, you've debunked every single piece of nonsense out there. And now you but you're, you're throwing your hat in this one. It's like, OK. And, uh, you know, he was such a good guy and he wasn't trying to prove anything. It's just this. So is there a kind of room for that kind of truth in your uh, religious naturalism? Oh, well, there's not. Oh, in the in in the orientation. Uh Sure. I mean, again, people who have that, you know, come down the way Martin has, they have a lot of work to do. I mean, you know, th th there must be in his mind a constant uh, reset <laughs> to go from what he understands about the natural world to the, a belief in the afterlife. Let's let's go there because that's the biggie, of course. And um, so... Um, uh, since I don't have to go there, I, I have a lot easier time of it. Um, I can just do my thing and look at nature and see what, how it makes me feel and how it informs my activities and I don't have to worry about God. I actually call myself a non-theist because an atheist, to my mind, has a belief. They believe, they believe that there's no God. And so I'm trying to sort of wing out, well, how about a non-theist is somebody who isn't interested in the question? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there's so much to think about and that all God talks sort of gets in my way, um, including, you know, Richard Dawkins saying it's stupid. Um, but we all have our, we all make our peace. Well, so sometimes it's called apathyism. Right, I'm just well, apathetic to the whole question. <laughs> but you're not apathetic because you wrote a whole book on it. I'm, I'm, I think about it all. I mean, I you know I'm engaged in the question, but I the idea of whether we're going to have the perfect proof of whether God exists or not exists, I think is boring. Yeah, but from what you said earlier, it sounds like to you the problem of evil is a pretty serious one for the believer, which I would agree. Oh and, yeah. Yeah, and you know they I write mean, books about this. You know, oh, God works in mysterious ways, or it makes yeah. people stronger, or you know they get moral values out of suffering or whatever. You know, I, to me, I, I don't. It doesn't square any of it for me. But no, for so you have believers. to redefine God and say that God, you know, withholds benefits and uh, isn't all loving and all benevolent. Um, it's more complicated than that. And then you read the Bible, and you sure get a very complicated personality coming through whatever for whatever that's worth. I, I just don't like it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very happy to keep talking about God. This is your show, but I mean, I don't have, I'm not sure I have a whole lot more to say about it.
Do you yeah. have any other things you want to talk about? Yeah, I'm I'm going through a whole series of questions oh, here good. for okay. you. Uh, I, I mean, so to the believer, okay, then how do you explain the fine tunedness? You know, here I'll just read you, Stephen. The, yeah, I, your, I, I love the fine tune. Oh, or maybe you're listening. Maybe you're listening. Well, just me. just let me tee it up for for, for okay. the listener so you can uh, give the proper answer. This in response to your own passage that you quote, Stephen. Here, uh, wait. Here it is. So this is uh, you speaking here about your own journey, reflections on all this, the night sky and so on. When I later encountered the famous quote from the physicist Steven Weinberg, the more the universe seems comprehensible, Did the more just... it seems pointless, I wallowed in its poignant nihilism. And I froze before Stephen Hawking's question, what is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for humans to describe? A bleak emptiness overtook me, this is you speaking now, mm -hmm. uh, whenever I thought about what was going on out in the cosmos or deep in the atom. So I did my best not to think about such things and thought about biology instead. But since then, I have found a way to defeat the nihilism that lurks in the infinite and the infinitesimal. I've come to understand that I can deflect the apparent pointlessness of it all by realizing that I don't need to seek a point in any of it nor do I need an answer to Hawking's question. Instead, I can see it as the locus of mystery, the mystery of why there's anything at all rather than nothing, the mystery of where the laws of physics come from, the mystery of why the universe seems so strange. Mystery, inherently shrouded in its own absence of category, its own absence of an answer. But I can see why the believer is not satisfied with that. It's like, come on, I want an answer. What, what's your explanation? I don't have one, so if you want to come up with one, go for it. Well, lots they of do. Them the fine yeah, tuner. Yeah, lots of them out there. <laughs> well, you I mean, know, the... the, um, and, and you know, it's not like there's one uh, version of what God is like that everybody believes in. There are gazillions of them, uh, and gazillions of explanations for evil, and gazillions of explanations for you know why prayer doesn't work, even though you prayed your heart out, your kid still dies. Um, so. Uh, I'm I'm perfectly happy not having the answer, but if people want an answer, they can't. They're not going to get it from me. Yeah, I understand, but that's I think that's <laughs> one of the drivers of religious beliefs is that there, without an outside source, some some you know Archimedean point outside of the whole thing that justifies purpose, meaning, morality, objective values, and and so on. It just feels well pointless. There's nothing I can say to that, Michael. <laughs> I can't. I can't give them an answer. They have to come up with one on their own. I'm happy without an answer. And do you do that for? Well, just just move up the scale, okay? Origins of yeah. life. We don't know the origin. We don't know what the answer to that is yet, right? I mean, this is right. now in your field. What's the best explanation yeah. we have for the origin of life at the moment? Well, I have a chapter on it. Yeah, yeah. give it to me. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to summarize the chapter? Yeah, just or? give us a short, yeah. So the theist says, come on, uh, you know, there was a, a gap. God reached in, stirred the particles to get the first life forms going. What is your answer? Uh, well, first of all, you have to do, you have chemistry, okay? So once the earth cools down, there are sites where you can do have chemistry and things are energized and can interact, and then they cool down and they form new molecules and uh, so you get new molecules and then um, I'm very fond of you know in the Terry Deacon Francisco Varela trait of saying that when molecules interact with one another they um, you can often get something else from nothing but their shape has um, a function and the function that Varela and can talk about is the ability to catalyze chemistry. So if you have a shape that can catalyze chemistry that will make more of yourself, then you get what Varela called an autocatalytic cycle. And then Terry Deacon introduces the idea of containing that cycle in some sort of a capsid so that the components don't drift away. And um, that something like that, that he calls an autogen, um, has the core properties that we associate with life. It uh, self-maintains, it self-replicates, it self-protects, um, and um, 
is a self, um, it is an entity. And what I love about Terry's way of doing it and that I've adopted in the book is that I don't say, okay, you have a protein and you have DNA and you have a membrane, all of the things that are in modern organisms. This autogen is assembled from little squares and diamonds and circles. It, 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 it can be anything because the point is to lift up what being a self entails. And then once you get something like that going, then you can start having evolution. You can start having this thing be aware of its surroundings and, and so on. And you finally get to the, you know, the last universal common ancestor, which had DNA proteins and membranes, and then everybody evolved from that dude about, what, three billion years ago. Mm. Right, so if I understand this, just putting energy into a system of chemicals can generate an autocatalysis that is it's kind of a self feedback loop in which complexity naturally develops away from the super left wall of simplicity. Um, and once that takes off, then as long as you have energy in the system, it's just going to keep going on its own. And from that simple forms, you get emergent properties. Would you call it some, something from, no, something not else from nothing, but <laughs> something not else from nothing, me. but yeah. 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 Right. Um, and so, and that needs no outside source other than just energy. Right. And we got plenty of that. <laughs> we got plenty Big of stun. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Right. Okay. So from there we start to build now here, you kind of hinted at what could be a kind of form of consciousness, uh, self-awareness, a, a tiny organism with a, chemical gradient that it's moving toward or it's moving toward light or whatever it, it on some level knows it's a self it's here's its own little self-contained thing and there's an outside world outside of the membrane and the energy's over there and not over there so i'm going to go that way that's a kind of i don't know maybe consciousness is not the right word but so i call it awareness because that's a pretty i mean it's some for some people that's a very charged term but i think it's pretty generic and i say that bacteria are aware and protists are aware and trees are aware um and they uh certainly all of the modern organisms that evolved from a common ancestor um they use the same kinds of proteins to do that receptor proteins um that are in about 20 different families and and so it, we have nice modules now for doing awareness and awareness of just about everything has evolved in some critter or another. Um, the ones prior to that, the, the original autogen, you know, the awareness was probably pretty primitive. Just, oh, there's a sugar molecule I like or something. Um, you don't have to get it very fancy to have it be selected for. And could you, can you get to human consciousness and self-awareness, you know, the hard problem of consciousness? through scaling up from what you just described? I don't think it's a scaling up so much. It's just a diversity. I mean, it's the same, as I said, this, the same family of proteins. Uh, and then uh, animals, of course, came up with a really classy idea, which is to make this particular kind of cell called a neuron that has these receptors um, mm. in its dendrites, but also makes very long distances so that you can connect one part of the body with the other and uh, uses ion gradients and action potentials to move along these little wires. So once you get animals and neurons, then you, they very rapidly apparently figured out to get together as brains and uh, so that they can um, interact and control and modulate one another and get more... Um, subtle responses and um then you know we have we have those same brains and so then there's this one other little gimmick that we have which this i self i call it you know some people call it self-consciousness and there's all these words for it where we have this yada 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 <laughs> going on <laughs> internal <laughs> that chatter to, that goes to bed at night and wakes up in the morning and has an autobiography and, and all of that and um my sense, I mean, is that it is dependent on the fact that we have these brains that do symbolic language. And so we are basically telling ourselves stories about ourselves. And 
that that emerged in this human lineage. Maybe as a spandrel, who knows? There's a, there's a wonderful uh, book by Jeffrey Miller, The Mating Mind, where he talks about how uh, <clears throat> language evolved for mating purposes, that the, if you could tell the fair damsel or the handsome man how handsome and uh, <laughs> beautiful they were, that you had better success at mating. So um, there are all sorts of stories about that part of our minds. Yeah, you quote uh, Terrence Deacon here, biologically, we're just another ape. Mentally, we're a new phylum of organism. Yeah. That it does seem like human consciousness is, it's not just scaled up from chimps and dogs and rodents and all the way back. It seems like a whole different category. Well, I agree, but I also want to quickly say, particularly to any listeners here that it's it's not like it came out of the blue somewhere you know certainly not from god or whatever uh no, yeah. it's it's built i'm on an ape brain okay so uh there's no organ in there there's no uh sweet spot that suddenly switches on symbolic language somehow the ability to do that um evolved in the human lineage and evolved quite rapidly so uh Homo sapiens is what, 300,000 years ago. Um, that's, and we don't know whether they were talking yet, but certainly seems likely by 100,000 years because they're making art. Um, and presumably you make art to look at and show to other people. So you're communicating and you're using symbols. Like the, the burial, language gr was, burial graves. Languages were probably, yeah, languages were probably, you know, going in. And I love this whole idea that language has evolved to be learnable by children's brains and children's brain evolved to learn languages so that there's been this uh, positive reinforcement for developing whatever this skill is. Hmm. Isn't it a weird thing that languages are just learned naturally? You don't have to teach your kids how to speak. They just do it. But reading... Well, Teaching them to read and write. This is an. Uh, I have a six-year-old that I'm going through oh. this right now, right? <laughs> and it's like, you know, these little squiggles on the page, like what? And it's like how I feel when I look at German. <laughs> <laughs> it's how I look, feel when I look like a computer wiring diagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like what? How am I supposed to learn this? And yet, you don't have to teach kids how to speak. So that would imply a strong evolutionary origin, a template, you know, like. Um, uh, you know, sort of a universal grammar, an innate grammar, that kind of thing, language instinct. Well, I, you know, if 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 as this was happening, um, something like grammar showed up in a pre-human um, or some vestige of grammar, and that made it easier to communicate uh, and therefore easier to get the benefits of whatever language is giving you the benefit for, it would it would stick. Right. Um, and it would be there. So, yeah, children are language ready. Um, and they don't necessarily even have to hear it. We can teach blind ch uh, deaf children language. So it, it's it's interesting. And it's very, di I mean, all animals communicate. So this symbolic language is just a different critter. A big different critter, right? I mean, attempts to yeah. teach mm -hmm. apes language, sign language, for example, Washu and, and a Coco and the gorilla Fancy. and all those examples, they just can't do it. I mean, it's just not even remotely close to what humans can do. I mean, there does seem like a huge leap there. Okay. We don't have to do a God of the gaps thing. There's something that happened that just seems qualitatively different, not just quantitatively scaling up, but something massively different. Yeah. And I mean, I, I love uh, speculations that go as follows that, you know, everybody's looking for some widget that got added. Yeah. But what if what really sort of happened is more degeneration, um, mm. that hardwired ways of using the brain um, got co-opted for this language thing um, while uh, knee jerk stuff became less. So, um, there, there are many, I have one way of expressing that in the book, but, uh, it seems like, uh, that kind of thinking 
is more interesting to me than the continuous look for something that's going to light up an fMRI that is consciousness. <laughs> Do you mean uh, like a pruning away of stuff? Yeah. That was so, inter- I yeah. mean, there, so the, the, my thinking on this starts with um, a critter called the blind mole rat. So the blind mole rat is blind. It lives underground. Um, and it starts out embryogenesis just like any other critter like itself. It's closely related to a porcupine, okay, which you can see. Um, the As the brain is developing, the nerves that would grow out uh, to the optic cortex um, instead grow into auditory and um, olfactory domains of the brain and enhance them. So the old way isn't so necessary and the new way can be. And it, it says that there isn't like a visual neuron. A neuron is visual to the extent that it reaches uh, the visual cortex and uh, forms synapses with others and hooks up to the eye. There's just a whole interesting way of thinking about how our brains got different that um, are bonging around in chat rooms. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But we don't really have a scientific consensus on that yet. No, no. Not not that I've... I mean, there's some people who think they understand it, but I don't uh, agree that they're there yet. Yeah, so the question is, will we get there someday? Maybe the hard problem of consciousness is soluble and we'll get there in a century or 50 well, you years. You know what, Michael? There's a, there's a way that, you know, if you open the New York Times tomorrow and scientists have figured out how this works and it has to do with the thalamus and with the... Um, uh, intertercenary jigmajoo, right. and you would read that, <laughs> and you wouldn't learn anything more about self awareness than what you already know because it, it's what you inhabit. So the fact that there's, so it's the quintessence of of emergence, I would say that uh, emergence sort of masks the underbellies uh, of what's going on to generate something that is really something else altogether. Hmm. I wonder if it could be one of those, your mystery mysteries. Um, no, I, it, I, it, I think it's really different from the mystery of, you okay. know, of where the, I, I don't see any reason to think that it's not going to have something to do with the wiring of the billions, hundreds of billions of neurons in our, in our skulls. Uh, you know, all of the neuroscience that's been going on in the past decades has more and more given us the answer that, hey, what's, it's, it's in here. <laughs> yeah, for and, sure. And There's... Why, why should this one property that we think happens to be so important because it hounds us, um, it, there's no reason why that should be any different from the capacity to do all sorts of things. It's just a new way of getting things going, but we think it's really cool. So we elevate it to some mm. special thing and it is different. I mean, the, there's the question of whether dolphins have it, whether the, uh, whether the bonobos have it. I mean, you know, it's not like it's nothing. And then everything, there may well be manifestations of it in other critters, but we certainly have it in spades. And I think it's because we have symbolic language in spades. So mm. once we started using symbolic language to create narratives and stories, um, we started telling them to ourselves. So this is where you get the meta level of I'm aware that I'm aware that I'm aware and so forth. <laughs> and my dog can't do that. The chimps probably can't do that. We are the only species really probably that can do it, at least on our planet. Um as well so, as we do it. Let's, let's, let's have a caveat. Cause I, you know, say that dolphins, again? Oh, let's oh, have dolphins. the caveat. That, oh yeah. I mean, let's have the caveat that we're much better at it and okay, maybe, yeah, sure. yeah. and we okay. don't know what it's like to be a dolphin. So it That's may right. be that, uh, whatever it is that dolphins have that gives us a sense that there is a self-aware being inside there. Uh, it feels really different to a dolphin. So mm. anyway, 
Go ahead. I interrupted you, but oh, I... yeah, no, 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 that was fine. I, um, uh, <laughs> I, I was just thinking, yeah, the other mind's problem. I mean, I don't even know that you're sentient. I'm, I'm guessing you are. And I, <laughs> I apply the Copernican principle to myself. I'm not special. And, you know, if you're expressing the same things that I express, you probably have an internal world like I do. But I don't know that for sure, right? So, I mean, we could all be zombies. Um, yep. And, uh, or maybe we're all chat GPTs, <laughs> just a little more sophisticated. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's, let's not go there. <laughs> I mean, we can, if that's something you want to talk about. But No, um, no, I don't really okay. care about chat GPT. Um, I don't okay. think it's an existential threat uh, and no, that AI is going to okay. turn us all into paper clips. I don't think any of that's going to happen. No, 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 no. I do like, I don't know if you've read Antonio Damasio's um, work on this, where he talks about maps, you know, that, that there's just maps of your body, maps of different parts of your body, and then maps of the maps, and then maps of the maps of the maps. And at some point, you know, the maps just become aware of the other maps. Now, I'm not sure if there's a, if there's a move that he makes there, like, and then a miracle happens and then all of a sudden consciousness pops out of that. Well, okay. So, so, so first of all, I've, I've read most of Demacia, so I'm, okay. I, he's another one of my heroes. Um, and this map thing and everything, of course, would apply to, you know, a fish brain. Um, mm, so, yeah, of course, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, uh, Consciousness, I just went ahead and decided to use the term consciousness to be the cognitive and emotional uh, gestalt that happens to critters with brains. And critters with brains we call animals. So animals have this particular kind of consciousness uh, mediated by neurons and hormones um, that is um, in the moment, right? I mean, so that's... The, awareness in all critters at the moment, you don't have any problem thinking about that with a bacterium. It's going up its chemical gradient. But uh, consciousness in general is in the moment, including our basal consciousness. So in the moment, we are doing all sorts of stuff. The story that we hear and that people who meditate say, I've never been able to do this, but mm -hmm. they are, they assure me that they can get rid of that and just have their consciousness without the yada yada and that is an experience in the moment all right uh that's what they tell you to do um is to just think about your breath um or experience your breath <laughs> so that's right anyway. experience it. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, my wife and i went down to deepak chopra's place in carlsbad is oh yeah how did that go? chopra center but it's been a, uh, a long weekend doing uh, meditation and you know, drinking the, the tea and the yoga and all that. So it was great. Um, did it work? Did it work? Yes. It's an interesting question because if you go to a five-star hotel for four days next to the beach in Carlsbad, California, drinking tea and exercising <laughs> and doing yoga and you don't feel better, <laughs> you are really messed up, <laughs> right? I mean, come on. <laughs> all right. It's not an accident that these centers are always like in Hawaii and, and you know, the most you know, Sedona, Arizona, the most beautiful place, Esalon Institute. Of course you're going to feel better, but does it really work? I don't know. Did, it, did Michael take it home with him? Uh, <laughs> I really, no, I have, a, I have the same problem you have with meditation. You know, I'm sitting yeah. there going, oh my God, I'm so bored. <laughs> you know, and the chatter just i know I'm thinking I'm about, oh gosh what, what am i gonna have for dinner tonight <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Didn't go to but i'm told <laughs> like your friends tell you you know now you have to stick with it for six months or whatever every day for an hour and, and then then it'll, the chatter will go away i don't Maybe. have the time <laughs> yeah and i'm yeah. interested in the chatter i mean the ursula and i have uh I, I live alone and um you know we talk on a regular basis <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, let's continue on some of these big questions. So out of that, then where does the self come from? What is the self? How do you define the self? And out of that, where does free will, volition, whatever come from? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the big ones. So uh, as, as I said earlier, um, I'm proposing a la Deacon that a self uh, is, you know, a an entity that has the properties of... Uh, uh, repair and replication and so on, and it has chemical abilities to uh, exert constraints so that entropy is reduced and blah, blah, blah. And so that entity, however simple, however hypothetical, 
is a self which can then evolve. Okay, so the evolution of a self, um, when you don't even know what it's made for, you wave your arms, but what we know now is that all the selves on the planet have uh, are set up to evolve beautifully. They have these genomes with instructions and they're mutable and through selection and so you can get uh, selves that interact with the environment in myriad ways. Um, and yeah, so they're selves of all of all sorts. So it's not an illusion, it's a reality. Hmm. That's, that's how I would put it. <laughs> well, there's a lot of philosophers and some psychologists say that self is an illusion. There's no, there's no homunculus in there. That you're just. Oh no 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 no! I'm not talking about. A, so you just went to the human. <laughs> yeah yeah. Uh, so you you have to understand that all my research in the lab was on a single cell that you carry right, a, a little right. alga. Uh, so when I think of an organism, I think of that level of being an organism. A single cell that's aware that uh, gets resources, and that guy is a self. Now, this concept of self that you're referring, I think I heard you talking about, is that could be an illusion. We're up to humans, and we're up to the I self, and whether it really exists or whether there's a monculus inside there that's making it work. Um, that's a different question. So do you want to go there? I yeah, mean, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm repeating myself. My my sense is that this is something that uh, arose as we developed the ability to have symbolic consciousness and to work with narratives, and that therefore it is real. I mean, it's not uh, supernatural. It's uh, generated via neurons and material processes and energy requiring steps in ATP and everything else. Um, but uh, we, it doesn't feel material. I think that's one of the reasons mm. that we're so hung up on it. And I would say that's, it's, that is due to the fact that the nothing buts can feel different than the something else's. <laughs> and so since it doesn't feel material, we have all sorts of name for it, a soul and spirit and everything. And people can rightly argue that it's just an illusion, um, that it's just something that popped through our language based minds. But that's, I mean, we have to be careful when we talk about illusions and real, right? Because I mean, it is real. Uh, you, you and I are having this conversation, you know, regardless of whether, uh, my sentience is like your sentience and stuff. We're both acknowledging that we're sentient and um, moving forward with that premise. So it is real, um, but I think the people who are worried about real are worrying about whether there is a homunculus in there, whether there's some little dude switching Mini-me. the wires and everything. Uh, <laughs> and there's absolutely no evidence for that. Yeah. Yeah, no ghost in the machine, uh, but. I think you touched on it there. My intuition is that the mind, I have a mind that's floating around up there somewhere that is different than the brain. I don't feel the brain working. Yeah, right. It feels like there's something else, right? <laughs> yeah, and it always has. I mean, you know, all the humans have always had this weird sense and it's it's universal. All humans agree. So it happened, whatever causes it to, whatever it is that, and I, you know, I, when my cat is catching a mouse, uh, she's not thinking about how her neurons work either. Um, it's, it's <laughs> she's experiencing her experience uh, and her joy at catching the mouse. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's in the moment. I don't think that she thinks about it afterwards and writes a poem about it or anything, but. Um, but consciousness is, it's real. Another thing that we are able to do that many other animals probably can't do is what uh, Danny Kahneman calls the difference between the experiencing self and the remembered 
self. So the experiencing self is you just from moment to moment to moment and life is just going on like you, all the way down to single cells do this, right? But, but we have this remembered self that we have the story about, oh, this is what it was like 10 years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, and it can be very different from what actually happened, whatever that <laughs> memory is, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, we do have a remembered self. I, I call it an autobiographical self. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, it, it influences our perception of uh, what we're going to do. Um, and this is how I've always done it. So I'm going to do it that way again, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And out of that, do we have volition? I mean, you're a scientist. <laughs> Here we we go. live in I'll... a determined universe with cause and effect. <laughs> where, how do you explain where volition and choice comes from? Um, from the mind, uh, from the brain. <laughs> I certainly don't think it is coming from anywhere else. So we'll start there. Um, and so then the question that Jerry Coyne and there were all these other people go crazy about is, well, you don't really choose because it, it all was already set up and moving forward. And, uh, and to me, this, these conversations always when I enter them, I try to stay out of them actually, because <laughs> again, it's one of, it's like God conversations, but yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, what I, what it feels like is that it's the I self that's a problem, the, 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 the people that want, if the I self is, is in fact generated by the brain uh, as, I don't want to say an epiphenomenon, well, we could say epiphenomenon in the sense, if we, don't think that a phenomenon isn't real, um, but it emerges from the rest of what's going on in here. And um, uh, then we say, yeah, that's what I want to do. I mean, we, the choice bubbles up <laughs> into our I self. Uh, and, but, I can't buy the whole, whole idea that uh, the I self realization and experience is not informative. I mean, it still seems to me that uh, what it is that bubbles up can feed back and give information, instruction, uh, even punishment, shame, all sorts of things to the way the brain is working. So if that's free will, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I've sat through hundreds of free will conversations. Oh, I mean, I know. you know, and, they, I know. and, and, and well, to they, me it seems like it, they lose the fact, me every time. Yeah, they lose, they lose me too. And the fact <laughs> I mean, as an outsider, I'm not a philosopher. The fact that there's still, I still get books like every month, you know, I got the <laughs> definitive book on, for, I've solved it. It's determinism. No, I solved it. It's free will. Okay. If you guys are, you know, the professionals can't decide, then there's something wrong with the way the question is being phrased or the concepts are being presented. You know, how can the universe be determined and you have any kind of free will at all? There's, there's, no, there's no ghost of the machine. There's no homunculus. And if there was, that wouldn't solve the problem because that's the little, the little mini me is, making the decisions for you instead of you, right? So that doesn't help, uh, and so on. Well, so maybe along the lines of what we've been talking about, of degrees of freedom, that is the more complex the organism, the more emergent properties you get, uh, and out of that, there are a range of choices you can make, and the more complex, the wider the range is, more degrees of freedom you have, and that's it. That's where it comes from, and you, you identify, well, here's my options, and I think that's the one I want. And then you act on it. That's, that's as good as it gets. I agree. And, you know, there, I, re I really like what you just said. And there may also be books out there that say that, right? And the problem is that there's so many people getting into the act who, you know, start doing quantum effects and all sorts of other BS to my brain um, that, uh, the correct answer may well be out there, but I can't uh, sort the wheat from the shaft. <laughs> so I kind of try to stay out of the question. 
but there's, there's no question that we make choices but of course all animals make choices um so and those choices come from past experience and memories of where the mouse was i'm gonna go back there again um and so there's this kind of uh elevating the eye self the yada yada to have more power than it actually has but that isn't to say that it is a, an illusion either because it's real oh i'm here i am <laughs> it certainly has an effect as we know from cognitive psychologists who have studied beliefs in determinism or free will it affects how people interact with the world people that are primed to think that the universe is determined and they don't really have any volition at all are less inclined to act. Like, why should I bother to work on climate change or whatever? There's sounds no like, point. It's all sounds determined. Sounds like depression. <laughs> yeah, uh, right, exactly. And uh, yeah, so, and and I mean, maybe you know people like that. I, I don't know anybody like that. Um, I... Do you know people like that? Do you know somebody who actually... No, the, these are... The, no, I no. Mean, even determinists I know, they don't act like they live in the determined universe. Yeah, they act like they're freely choosing. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so the whole thing is... All right. Do you have... Well, let's move on to another. And do you have another thing that's... Uh, well, the last like, big one is really morality, okay. right? That's uh, for oh, okay. the traditional religion <laughs> mind. That's the biggest question of all, right? If right. there's no God, what's the source of morality? Is there any such thing as good and evil and right and wrong and so on? How do you conceive well, of that? Well, of course, the, you know, the, the monotheists say that you can't figure it out unless there's a God because there's no other way to figure it out. But, I mean, that's that's not true. <laughs> you can figure it out using all sorts of information uh, about how the world works. And uh, it, it doesn't have to be written on a tablet at all. <laughs> Um, but is, why should I be nice to somebody I don't know, some stranger? Well, because they might be nice to you next next time, uh, because you are a human. One of the things I try to develop in the last chapter is that we do um, <clears throat> try, I use the term virtue, which has a, a history in Greek philosophy, so it's not virtue, I'm virtuous, or, uh, it's uh, a sense of um, dignity and worth uh, that one tries to develop in oneself, and it's hard, and it, it often fails, but it's a path. And so one knows that to nurture other beings is the right thing to do. Um, one is taught that. One sees it in... Uh, social relations, and so one tries to extend that to someone that they don't know. Um, there, we are full of this complex emotion that has variously called compassion, human um, uh, <clears throat> empathy. Um, it's there, and it's actually there in lots of other animals as well. And uh, it kicks in if we are in a virtuous frame of mind so that we care and we want to help. And that doesn't, this, have, that doesn't have to come from God. Yes, of course, it could come from inside. And there's actually no other place it can come from <laughs> except your own mind. But here, let's just oh, channel, <laughs> channel Aristotelian virtue ethics. By this, I, I think you're arguing that um, it's not enough to fake being a good person because other people will know you're just, you're being kind of a Machiavellian manipulator and you're pretending to be nice because you want something from me and in kind of a calculating way, a utilitarian calculus. What you mean is if you actually act like a good person, then you become a good person. You feel it and you feel genuinely in your heart or mind <laughs> You know, I really want to do this because this makes this other person feel good. This and makes, makes me, me feel good, good to help somebody else feel good. Mm -hmm. And that's real morality. Mm -hmm. That's where I come out. I think that's as good as it gets. I mean, there's, haven't, and I don't see what the theist add-on adds. And then, and then what, adds. you know, what I go ahead and 
do is make the move of, okay, we can do that. How about other animals, critters, planet, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm calling eco-morality. Yeah, where I like that. It's, it's not a hard move if you're already on the path to developing virtues in yourself to extend those virtues to care about uh to care about the place <laughs> uh and try to live within it in the same way you live within your human culture so an expanding circle as peter singer yeah. calls it to encompass not only everybody but all other organisms and rivers and mountains <laughs> yeah nature itself <laughs> <Oceans>. right <laughs> right right okay but are you a vegan <laughs> uh no i'm not uh why not because um i am a mammal uh a carnivorous mammal that's my background uh even bonobos and chimps will will eat meat um and you know we we either eat or we're eaten um that's <clears throat> somebody's rule. <laughs> uh, yeah, nature's and, rule. Uh, and if I'm going to eat a plant, a plant is also alive. And when mm -hmm. I eat it, I'm killing it for my own benefit. Um, I do not eat red meat unless I'm taken to a fancy dinner. So I don't eat mammals. <laughs> Steakhouse. Uh, <laughs> I nice figure somebody else, somebody else killed that <laughs> animal. But, but I do it very rarely. I almost, uh, so I'm, I do eat uh, poultry, and I do eat fish. Uh, and th But these are choices. I mean, you know, that fish is going to die. That fish may be food for me, or it may be food for a whale, or it may be food for a, an osprey. Um, but it, it will either be eaten before it dies, or it will die. You probably know these arguments by animal rights activists about the sentience of certain organisms, if you go down the scale enough, you know, does a lobster feel pain? It's okay to mm -hmm. eat lobster or maybe not. Do you have a sense of where, you know, to draw the line what's, there? What's if you're the going to follow off? that pursuit. Well, I mean, even pain is kind of a tricky one to use as the, I mean, you can kill a fish mercifully so it doesn't feel pain, or at least the pain would be instantaneous if he chopped off its head. Um, and I have killed fish where I chop off their heads and they flip around a little bit and then they're dead. Um, and then I eat it. So I have no problem with people who do the vegan thing. I mean, but they have to remember that they're killing plants and plants are fully in our uh, evolutionary scheme. And so this idea that somehow uh, animal consciousness and animal experience um, is something that we need to protect more than plant experience is a judgment call. And, and it's kind of a selfish one. The animals are more like me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. If they're cute mammals, then that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Because I'm a cute mammal. Uh, <laughs> Like it's why the World Wildlife Fund chose the panda as its logo oh, <laughs> instead of the cockroach or something. Not a cockroach. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, let's let's kind of wrap it up here, Ursula. I want to okay. push you uh, beyond the page here for a few minutes, though. Beyond the book, that is to say, you don't talk much about politics in here. Uh, you know, in terms of like e ecological environmental, moral, ethics, and so forth, at some point you have to draw, make decisions. Like, are we going to raise taxes on carbon fuels or whatever? Uh, you know, and, and so how do you think about, just curious, to what extent scientists can determine uh, political values? Like, what's the right level of taxation or immigration? Or is abortion, you know, should pro-life or pro-choice, which is the right answer to their... I mean, do you, do, most scientists I talk to, they just punt on this and go, that has nothing to do with science. This is just pure politics. But is there not a sense that there is, we can kind of derive some kind of truths about human values based on what people want, mostly freedom and autonomy and choice and so on. And therefore, you know, you have the rights of the fetus, you have the rights of the woman, some, something's got to go. I'm going to pick the rights of the woman for these following reasons. And, and that's, 
it's not perfect science, but at least it's informing a, a moral value. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd even call it science. I would, I, I mean, I, I use the term science as a, as a, it's a way of knowing. It's a, it's an activity. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a way of asking questions. Um, and so what we get is answers that tell us how nature works. Okay. And then we use those answers to make things. So that's called technology. Um, and so a scientist who goes to work every day in the lab and is trying to push back the envelope and figure something out, um, there's no reason why that has anything to do with whether a woman should have an abortion or not. Um, so whether a woman has an abortion or not, and whether abortion is allowed or not allowed, uh, is a collective decision, as we've discovered, uh, that different groups have different feelings about. And my, as a religious naturalist, what I'm trying to promote is that in that conversation, there should be understandings from the natural world, such as, you know, when does fetal heartbeat begin? When, uh, you know, uh, how does... Um, is there such a thing as an abortion that the fetus doesn't feel pain? Th these are questions that can be answered using our scientific-based understandings of nature. And those understandings need to be brought to the table as people are having the conversations. The conversations themselves, in terms of abortion, are... Uh, completely Michigan at me. I mean, they're completely all over the place. They're, they're, you know, there's um, uh, people who say God says it's not supposed to happen and God created and everything. You can't argue with that. I mean, you can't, it, it, we're back to where we were at the very beginning of our conversation. Uh, there's the claim of what God wants that somebody is making that they came up with or learned or somehow have this argument and it its status is then to be weighed against all the other social things like the woman doesn't want to have the baby like she was raped like you know um the there's the amniotic tests indicate that the fetus is compromised um all sorts of information that go into the decision mhm mm Right. Uh, and I think our intuitions about the trimester system have been borne out pretty well by science. That is, most people agree that abortion in the first trimester is okay. Most agree that abortion in the third trimester is not okay. And then we argue about where to draw the line week 20 or 22 or 24 or whatever. Right. So there's very few Republicans who think it should be completely 100% banned. You know, most Republicans tell posters that first trimester is probably okay. And most liberals or Democrats oh. <laughs> don't think abortion can be committed the day before the birth. No. Right? <laughs> right. Even though you can find examples on both sides that are, you know, paraded in the media as typical, but they're not typical. And, no. and so mm -hmm. one final example here, like slavery, you know, now why has it been banned in every country in the world in the last two centuries? Is it just a random relative cultural shift and maybe it'll come back in centuries hence? I don't think so. So my sense is that the discovery of human nature and the study of what people actually want and that gearing our politics toward human, you know, the nature, the constitutions of countries should match the constitutions of people, human nature. Uh, people don't want to be enslaved, as Lincoln said, as I would not want to be enslaved, I would not be a slave. Uh, I would not want to be a slave. I would not be a slave ho owner and, and so forth. And that, that kind of, principle of interchangeable perspectives. How would I feel if I was a slave? Well, okay. So we've all gotten better at thinking about those kinds of thought experiments and applying it to our politics. That kind of progress seems to me to be something like a discovery made about how human society should be structured. Not randomly. It's not just re cultural relativism. It's a real thing. I agree. We're getting smarter. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I mean, Stephen Pinker makes that point very nicely in his book. I mean, there's just all sorts of ways that we 
don't do terrible things to each other that we used to do. And presumably that's because we have this marvelous thing called culture, which remembers and passes something on. And we have this capacity to teach. We don't just imitate with a termite stick or something like that. Uh, because we have language, we can explain, um, we can point to past examples, um, all sorts of stuff that we can do that, that um, other critters don't do. And, you know, they do other things that we can't do. We can't <laughs> swim underwater for four, four hours. <laughs> so um, there's, but we're, we're making progress. The, the, you know, we're, we're Part of the problem is that we're such, uh, I don't know how else to say it. We can't keep our eyes off of train wrecks. <laughs> <Yeah. We're, laughs> we put them in our newspapers. We, you know, uh, the, it, a man gives his seat to a old lady in a bus. It doesn't make the six o'clock news. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, right. Right. The bus crashes. It's the six o'clock news. Uh, the driver was, a dope addict um, gets all the uh, narcotics people uh, going. All right. All right, Ursula, tell people, <laughs> tell my listeners where they can sign up for this, your religious naturalism uh, organization oh, and, and where to find that online. Oh, okay. So the unfortunately, we got a... Uh, URL, all the other URLs were taken, so we had to have one with hyphens. So it's oh. um, religious hyphen naturalist hyphen association dot org. Perfect. I'll put that in the, we'll put that in the all show right. notes and people can just scroll down and, <laughs> and click. And... I give the, if, if anybody buys the book, I actually give the URL twice in the book. Oh, so. nice. There it is. Okay. Beautiful cover. Love that. <laughs> so it, uh, Active mind like yours, you're always working on new things. What what else is coming down the pipeline for you? What are you working on besides I'm a, promoting your? <laughs> I'm a marketer for this bleeping book. I mean, it's you good. know, I don't know about your publishing houses, but my my editor just said, I, "It's my experience, Ursula, that the books that do the best are the ones where have shameless promotion by their authors." <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> We, we will shamelessly show the cover and provide a link to where to order the book.